my friend. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode here on the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project podcast. And I am excited to bring you today's episode because I just got off this amazing conversation you're about to hear with Dr. Dan Gubler. He's one of our expert guests we brought on because Dr. Dan is an organic chemist and a researcher who's dedicated his life to studying plants and the special compounds in plants called phytonutrients and how those affect human health. And over the past several decades, Dr. Dan has formulated supplements for many companies. He's formulated over 70 different supplements that have grossed over $500 million in sales. And the reason is, is Dr. Dan understands the different kinds of foods, phytochemicals that improve our health. And over this conversation, I basically pick his brain and we talk about some of the best foods for improving your blood sugar, for improving your blood pressure, for improving cognitive health. He talks about the best supplements for men and women over 40. So it's just a jam impact conversation. And I think it's pretty rare to actually have like a true chemist on here that can also communicate in a way that's like understandable. He's not just throwing out all these crazy chemistry terms. He's basically saying, go here, buy this, eat this, try this spice. And I think you're going to find this conversation absolutely fascinating like I did. So without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Dr. Dan Gubler. All right, Dr. Dan, welcome officially to the Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project podcast. I'm really happy to have you here today. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you so much. So I'm particularly excited because um, you're going to be probably the the man with the deepest expertise we've ever had on to talk about phytonutrients, some of the powerful compounds in plants, as well as just your long history as a chemist, as a researcher, and a man who's gone through his own health journey to get himself healthy. So I, I think for everyone listening, this is going to be a powerful conversation. There'll be some specifics on stuff that Dr. Dan recommends to improve health. And as well as I I just kind of want to pick your brain on overall health philosophy, because I I know you're as much of a practitioner of this stuff personally as you are a researcher. So um, to kick things off, I'd love for you to kind of give a little bit of your personal story in an abbreviated version of how you got into chemistry and studying plants and the powerful compounds in there. Yeah. So I have always wanted to be a chemist. Uh, my hero was my grandfather. Uh, my on my dad's side, he was a chemist. He he studied biochemistry. He was one of the first ones to figure out what copper does in the body, um, how copper is a cofactor for enzymes. He was one of the first ones to work on thiamine and the role of thiamine in the body and its function. And so I grew up pounding around in his lab. Uh, he gave me a my parents gave me a chemistry set when I was uh, nine years old, and my grandpa said, "Well, let's supplement this with some cool stuff that he had from his lab." So. Um, I've always loved chemistry. Um, During the summertime, you know, those boring summer days when you're a kid and there's nothing to do, I would beg my mother to, if I could go into her kitchen and use her herbs and the stuff that I had from my grandpa's chemistry set and make potions. So I loved to make potions and then um, we'd play around with them. Um, One of our favorite games to play was, uh, you know, capturing people and whatnot, you know, as young boys do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when someone was captured and in prison, the ransom for them to get out was to try just a little bit of my potion. And so (laughs) I'm not, I'm not proud of that, you know, but back in the day when kids are crazy, that's kind of what you do. So I've always loved experimenting with compounds from plants and formulating things. That is so special. Like I love hearing these stories and it is really amazing how we all have these unique interests that blossom from the family we were born into, the interests, early interests that we we're exposed to. And I think it's really special that this many years later, you're still making potions, <laughs> yeah. although they're more in like the pharmaceutical grade level and, you know, stuff like stuff like this, like major supplements. So that's fantastic. Super cool to hear. Um, now let's talk about What's going on as you see it right now in the world with health, with people particularly over 40? Like, obviously, we know we look around, people are not doing well with their health. There is an epidemic of obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome of all sorts. Like, what's really going on? And what's your read on the situation? Yeah. So like you said, there's a metabolic plague sweeping the earth. And you just mentioned most of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. And of those criteria that you mentioned, if you have at least three of those five, you have metabolic syndrome. And we have uh, one in three Americans have metabolic syndrome. It's even higher in some countries in the Middle East. It's, it's about 50%. And so, yeah, there's a metabolic plague sweeping the earth. When we talk about metabolism, it's the sum total of chemical reactions that go on in the body every single second. And a lot of these reactions are fundamentally broken. They're not happening at the the cadence that they should, or in a lot of cases, they're not happening at all. And 
my read, when you look at it, it comes back to my expertise, my passion, what we're talking about, phytonutrients. We're not getting phytonutrients from plants in our diet. Phytonutrients are the medicinal components of plants. When you look at pharmaceutical drugs, 50% of all pharmaceutical drugs are either phytonutrients themselves that pharmaceutical scientists have taken directly from the plant and they're selling it, or when they went to discover a drug, a phytonutrient from a plant was a starting point that they used. It was the inspiration mm -hmm. that they used to make that drug. And mm -hmm. so it makes sense that with the modern processed diet, it's devoid of phytonutrients. Right. And if we're not getting these phytonutrients that are catalysts that help these metabolic reactions take place, um, it's not surprising that metabolic health is going down the toilet. Right. Really well said. And I, I think it kind of comes down to we've kind of reduced a lot of our perspectives on nutrition to macronutrients, to looking at the label and what's how many proteins, carbs, fats are in there. And we also know there's just a tremendous difference between getting 15 grams of sugar from, let's just say, processed refined sugar or getting that 15 grams of sugar from blackberries, where it's paired with fiber and all sorts of different phytonutrients, where the interaction with that sugar is completely different in the presence of all these other compounds that are naturally found in, in really good stuff for our bodies. Yeah, that's exactly right. Diet culture is obsessed with macros. You know, we're all about macro ratios and counting macros and whatnot. And macros are fuel. And, you know, I don't want to downplay them. They're, they're absolutely vital for metabolic health. Um, and, but using the fuel analogy, you know, a, a car, it can have a full tank of gas. But if you don't have the spark plugs and the engine and the transmission and the brakes and all the other features that utilize that fuel to allow the car to propel and to go, then you're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right. So let's, let's start to turn to some specifics. Like when we look at the metabolic syndrome epidemic that's going around, what are some things that people can start doing in terms of perhaps adding in like certain foods or certain phytonutrients that they may be in a supplement form and maybe even taking away, which might just be like some kind of lifestyle modifications. I'd love for you to speak on both sides of that coin. Yeah. Um, so first, one of the things that I just study a lot, you know, supplements are great, you know, but food, food is medicine. We've, we've all heard the, the quote by Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And so for me, there's really simple things that you can do to help uh, to really dramatically improve your health, especially 40 plus by just eating good foods. You know, one of those um, inflammation is is key, right? We want to reduce mm -hmm. inflammation. And there is a really cool phytonutrient called fal falcarinol. And falcarinol is found in, ca in carrots, celery, fennel, parsnip, and coriander. And it has really potent anti-inflammatory properties. When you look at the scientific literature, it's as good as NSAIDs, it's Tylenol, <laughs> and, um, you know, and Advil and these different NSAIDs. And it's, it's amazing. So I, I know the, we have the celery juice movement and stuff like that. But just eating celery, carrots, and fennel. I don't know if your listeners have used fennel, but I, I've been uh, cooking fennel for the past couple of years. I love it. It just has a really mild nice. taste. It's easy to cook up. And it provides large amounts of this falcarinol product that really helps to reduce inflammation. That's really cool. And I, I think, especially when you start to learn more about the medicinal properties of specific foods, it makes you more likely to want to eat them. Because we've all heard you know, eat your vegetables, and I think that's 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 fine and well. We know there's something good, but when you can connect on a deeper level and being like, "Wow, I'm getting a, a really potent dose of natural anti-inflammatories that's fantastic for my body," it's going to make that fennel carrot saute that you put on the side of your dinner like that much more appealing and 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 and, and, and nourishing on many levels, not just physically, but you're doing something good for yourself. So it, it's like self care. Yeah, exactly. And knowledge is power, obviously. And so understanding that there's these medicinal pharmaceutical grade phytonutrients in foods can really take our health to the next level. You know, another example, when we talk about inflammation, hydroxytyrosol from olive oil is great. There's a really cool compound called arbutin from pears that's really potent at, at uh, lowering blood pressure. And a lot of blood pressure pharma drugs on the market today actually used arbutin as a starting point, uh, yeah. we know we know about resveratrol from red wine, you know, and its ability to help with with cognitive health and all aspects of health. Um, vanillin is another re really cool compound that can help with brain health, and vanillin is found in rye bread and oats and and cacao and vanilla and sherry. So we can just kind of go down, you know. Allicin from garlic is great. Mm -hmm. Narragenin from citrus. 
In apples, you have some really cool compounds called florizidin that helps with uh, blood sugar control. And another really cool one um, called floritin that helps with cholesterol control. And <laughs> so, you know, I could talk about this for hours, but yeah. it's really, it's just really powerful that when you understand that there's certain phytonutrients from different foods that can really help with all of the areas of metabolic health that us 40 year olds, you know, me, myself, you know, I'm, I'm 43. When you talk about inflammation, blood pressure, cognitive health, cholesterol control, blood, blood sugar control, microbiome control and health, right, right. heart health, insulin control, skin health, weight loss. You know, you could just kind of go through the gamut. And for each of these conditions that we suffer with, there are potent phytonutrients from foods that can help. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the, the ironic part is the flip side is if you're not getting these foods, you're likely getting the opposite. You're getting something that's processed, which is directly inflammatory in many cases, whether it's sugar, different kinds of vegetable oils or trans fats. So it's like you're either giving yourself a dose of health or in, in some sense, a dose of poison. And, and you, you ultimately were trying to make better choices. What I also think is really cool is all of these foods and in, in particularly fruits and vegetables that you've listed so far also have that beautiful type of fiber that your gut bacteria thrive on. So you're getting the benefit of, of the, the phytonutrients in these foods, as well as just the gut bacteria are going to thrive in the presence of a lot of this stuff too. So it's a double whammy for your health. So it's not surprising that these things are so good. Okay. So this begs the question for me, because I'm really curious, how do you go about your day? Like what kind of foods are you directly getting in? What do you eat in the morning? Um, do you, do you fast? Do you have breakfast? What do you try to, what kind of foods are you trying to get in on a daily and weekly basis? I'd love to know. Cause like, you know, all the specifics of many of these things. I'm curious, what are the main things that are getting onto your plate and into your mouth on a daily and weekly basis? Yeah. So I, um, alternate between a 16, eight intermittent fasting schedule. And then I also do just a standard four, four, 12, where you eat breakfast, you don't snack for four hours, you eat lunch, you don't snack for four hours, you eat dinner. And then you you fast for at least 12 hours before eating. That's exactly day. how our program members eat. They're using one of those two setups for sure. And occasionally they do 24-hour fasts. So yes. And intermittent fasting, I, I'm sure you've talked about it on your show and your listeners know all about it, but it's just marvelous the benefits that happen when we intermittent fast. Insulin levels are able to stabilize. Gut microbiome, the you know the microbes in the gut are able to reset. And you know, I was just reading a paper a few weeks ago where they showed the benefit of the gut microbiome and the reset properties, and several species of good bacteria that are able to grow and flourish two or threefold by just intermittent fasting once. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're not talking about for the long haul, but yeah. um, just just fasting once in, uh, for the morning time. I like to eat a lot of polyphenols. I like apples. I, I like blueberries. My go-to is I protein is the best macro for you in the morning, according yeah. to a lot of papers that I've read. So I have a protein shake where I throw in about 20 to 30 grams of protein. Then I throw in a cup of blueberries because I, you know, we, I really like those polyphenols and, mm -hmm. um, uh, cacao nibs. So yeah. cacao has so many amazing properties it when does. it comes to blood pressure, heart health, cognitive health, natural energy with the EGCG. So I, I use some cacao nibs and that's usually what I do for, for breakfast. Just kind of a simple uh, protein as a macro and then a good, uh, good phytonutrient source. Depending on what I have in my refrigerator, you know, if I have strawberries or blackberries, um, you know, maybe a banana once in a while. Um, I throw that in. Bananas, um, I don't know uh, about you guys, but I love bananas. It has dopamine. It's a really nice hit. You know, bananas are vilified by a lot of people, but I, I think they're a great... Uh, superfood. Yeah. I'm kind of with you on that. You know, I think bananas, the thing about bananas is, is the timing of them are, is pretty important. Like eating a banana that's still like green tipped. It has all those great fructo oligosaccharide, you know, fibers that are really great for your gut. And then when it gets really like mottled and like old, you got the sugar alcohols and like, and it actually kind of tastes alcoholic. So get the bananas while they're still like you know, dense and, and early, but that's fantastic. And I think it's really amazing that you throw in cacao and protein and, and some polyphenols in your shakes, because this is what our members are doing too. They're using some organic cacao, cacao powder in a shake with some protein, with some other different, you know, phytonutrients jammed in there. So it's good that you've, you've landed on the same kind of thing. So you load your body up with good protein, you have stable blood sugar. It's not a hard meal to digest and you're getting God good polyphenols. And then what happens for the rest of your day? And, and I'd also like to hear you speak on some hydration stuff you do as well throughout the day. Yeah. For hydration. Um, I like water. Water's amazing. I'm kind of simple that way. Simplistic. Um, there's different electrolytes that I'll throw in once in a while. 
there's a really cool ingredient that I've that I've been working with. I worked with MIT professors that have started this uh, this company, and they found this ingredient from palm fruit um, that contains really good electrolytes, large amounts of potassium, but it contains uh, shikimic acids, which is a really yeah. unique phytonutrient. We've heard about chlorogenic acids and whatnot, yeah, yeah. but shikimic acids are kind of the next frontier. So these professors found that when they make palm oil, this really terrible process, you know, but uh, but when they get the oil, um, you have to mix oil and water to get it together. And they do that to get the oil separated and to get it really nice and pure. Um, but the water was just a waste stream. So they would throw that away. Well, these professors analyzed the water and they found that it contained these sh- these chemic acids. And so I, I use that. Um, I... I really am very careful when it comes to hydration. I like I like water. You know these mm-hmm. these uh, drinks that that people drink during the day. A lot of times they're spiked with different things that I just try to keep things uh, pure yeah, and yeah. clear. Um, for lunch, I love protein. Um, a lot of times I'll do a high quality protein bar, uh, but I really mix it up with a lot of phytonutrients. I mm-hmm. I eat an apple every single day. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if I haven't had my banana for um, for breakfast, sometimes I'll do that for lunch as well. Uh, mix that with protein. Um, I'll, I'll do a salad a lot of times. For me, it's it's really a protein and complex carbs is what I what I try to do for lunch. Yep. And I try to keep it uh, light. You know, it depends on the person, but I I don't do well performance wise when I have a really heavy lunch when it sits in my gut. For sure, and, sure. You know, yeah, you, you go into that food coma at one or two yeah, or three yeah. three o'clock, and so I like Definitely. to keep it light. Um, I really I really like nuts. Nuts are an amazing powerhouse of phytonutrients. You have walnuts that help with heart health. Pistachios are really good uh, when it comes to blood sugar control. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of pine nuts. Pine yeah, nuts yeah. are actually, they contain a compound that's an appetite suppressant. Um, I know a lot of people, um, you know, go back and forth with nuts. There's a lot of people that are talking about lectins in nuts and, yeah, sure, sure. and, and anti-nutrients, you know, and that sounds cool and attractive, I guess, if, you know, from a marketing standpoint, but I haven't seen, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen anything like solid in the scientific literature on lectins and anti-nutrients and their detrimental impact on health. Totally. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, look, some certain people are very sensitive to certain types of lectins. And I mean, there's certain things that do need to be prepared properly, like maybe some soaking and some sprouting. But man, I mean, I have not seen anyone have a problem really with having some walnuts and pistachios and not reaping the benefits of those. They're absolutely fantastic. And one 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 that I would add to the list that I'm a big fan of is macadamia nuts. I don't know if you use those, but they're just so high in the monounsaturated fats that are just beautiful for you. But those are like probably my top three is probably pistachios, walnuts, and macadamias. But nice that you're using that that nut mix. And you can make it taste pretty good too if you throw in some, you can throw in some spices. My wife sometimes puts a little olive oil on them, some rosemary, some cayenne, salt, pepper, and it's like, wow, tastes delicious. Yeah. Another nut that I love are uh, Brazil nuts. Brazil oh, yeah, nuts yeah. Brazil nuts are my jam. Um, yeah. Maybe I should have mentioned them first, but uh, there's Brazil nuts are super high in selenium. So eating yeah, just yeah. a couple of Brazil nuts, between two to three Brazil nuts, depending on how big they are, give you 100% RDA of selenium. And selenium yeah, yeah. is amazing when it comes to cognitive health. There's been sure, sure. really cool clinical studies especially in, uh, in in rest homes where people are experiencing cognitive decline and taking just two Brazil nuts a day, um, they, they actually go back, the cognitive, improve, uh, cognitive uh, scores improve dramatically. And um, the selenium in Brazil nuts are organoselenol compounds. So it's selenium that's complex with organic carbon-based compounds and the absorption of, of selenium into the body is just dramatic. So th- I love selenium, really good for immune health as well. And I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. That's fantastic. You know, th- yeah, thyroid health, immune health, adrenal health. Our family, we keep Brazil nuts like we have like a stash. Like I wouldn't say we only take like a couple at a time, but we have like a stash anytime we use them. I think the reason I got really privy to them many years ago was I also was learning that selenium sequesters mercury in the body. It binds it binds it up some of the methyl mercury too. Because I was like a little worried, like man, we're having sushi all the time. Is methyl mercury a concern? Maybe. And so we started taking some Brazil nuts around the time when we had that too. So everyone listen up. That's a little another pro tip from Dr. Dan. I get some Brazil nuts. I would not eat a whole handful of the time, just a couple once in a while because they're so potent in selenium. And that's that's amazing. Cool. So you get your nuts in, take us through the rest of the day, some other things that are, are important and come up. 
yeah, I don't do any snacking. And then when it comes to the evening time, uh, good protein as well. Um, I like fish. You mentioned fish. I, I try to eat fish one or two times a week. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, I live in Utah, so I'm in the Midwest. Um, not there's, a, there's about uh, 1500 miles of beachfront property until you actually get to the beach, you know, so I'm yeah, not, yeah. not super close to the coast. So we don't have what you would consider fresh seafood, but, um, there's been a lot of research that's been done on analyzing the frozen fish that you find at the store. And that's still really full in omega-3 fatty acids because of the nature when they catch the fish on the boat, they, they gut it and then they flash freeze it. And vacuum still a lot of times right there on the boat. So it still has really high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids, sardines, you know, what if, if that's yeah, your yeah. jam, really good amounts. We of talk about it more fans. Yeah. 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 So um I like to do uh fish if I can. Uh om- what's really interesting is omega-3 fatty acids are actually the pro drug. They're not the bioactive compound. <laughs> in the body. So um, your, your listeners know about inflammation and they probably yeah. know about prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromboxanes. These are the molecules in the body that cause inflammation, right? So when we get a cut, a really bad cut, a lot of times you don't sense pain right at that point, right? You look mm-hmm. at it and you're like, oh man, that is probably going to hurt. And then right as you say that, after two or three seconds, then the pain comes. That's because the body's producing these pro-inflammatory molecules. Um, in the body, though, you you have compounds that are and the antithesis, and they're called resolvins, protectins, and maresins. And those, in order to be produced, they come from EPA and DHA, the fatty mm-hmm. acids in fish. So really, we need those fatty acids in order for the pro-resolving mechanism in the body to happen. So nice. I really try to get a lot of fish. I have a question for you. Um, Thoughts on you doing daily omega three supplementation versus having fish from you know fish or some kind of omega source a couple times. Whether someone's taking cod liver oil or they're eating wild caught salmon a few times per week, uh, I've heard a mixed bag, and I'd love your take on daily supplementation with omega threes or just episodically getting them a few times per week from natural food sources. Yeah, if if pro inflammation, if your body is naturally pro inflammatory, you know, if forty plus. A lot of times we just have these nagging inflammation. It could be for a variety of different reasons. If if uh, reducing inflammation is important for all of us, but mm-hmm. for some people it's more important than others. Correct. If you really want to do reduce inflammation, taking a daily omega three supplement is the absolute best thing that you can do. There's other <laughs> things that are that can reduce inflammation, curcumin and, and boswellia and a bunch of other things. Uh, but omega three fatty acids, amazing. Now there's been a lot of literature. Um, and it's uh, there's been few few papers that have been published uh, the past year showing that those people who take omega three fatty acids could be more prone to an irregular heartbeat, especially AFib. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But and it's a really important but that research is shown on people who take over four grams of omega three fatty acid supplements a day. But okay. if you take the normal dose, the normal dose that does a fantastic job is one point about one point three grams. So one to two grams, yeah. 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 yeah one point three to two grams, you know, where you have uh six hundred megs or above of EPA and you have four hundred megs or a little bit more of DHA. And there's been a lot of research done. When that AFib research came out, there was another paper that came out right after it showing that yeah, four grams it, it, it's not a sure thing for AFib, obviously, but you do have an increased risk. But they show that if you take 1.3 to 2 grams, they didn't see any significant risk for AFib uh, when you take omega-3. So uh, that was a long answer. But yes, nice. omega-3 good fatty answer, acid yeah. supplements, I'm, I'm a big fan. They're really good. Yeah. And I would say quality matters pretty substantially when you get those. Like you definitely don't want to buy just some random crappy product. You'd want something from a pretty reputable brand. They test these things because those fats can become rancid and, you know, they're very good with proper supplements at keeping them stable. Like how do you, in what form do you get your omega threes? Yeah. So I like the, uh, I like the triglyceride form where it's molecularly distilled. To do that, they have to uh, break apart the triglyceride, then they get the free fatty acid, and then they then they add it back. The ethyl ester is good too, but I, I prefer the, the uh, triglyceride form. It seems like it's a little bit more bioavailable. And then you're spot on. It needs to have um, antioxidants like rosemary, yeah, vitamin, vitamin, e, e, rosemary vitamin E, yeah, and different antioxidants that help to stabilize that because it is prone to degradation. Um, uh, th- a lot of it is how it's how it's made, you know, really, really high quality uh, fish oil supplements, omega-3 supplements are made where 
these oils never touch air at any time. They have uh -oh. a vacuum sealed process. Uh -oh. So there's really cool stuff where it's vacuum sealed throughout the entire process. You don't, uh, it doesn't touch air at all. And those are the ones that not surprisingly don't give you the fish burps and whatnot. And then you have other ones, like you said, that are just not made to high quality. The oil sits around and when it sits around and it touches air, it's oxidized. And so yes, that's, yes. that's when you get these amines and these other compounds. Putrescine uh, yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't amine. So when you burp, yeah, yeah. The fish burp, that's because of the amine called putrescine, and that happens when these fatty acids are exposed to air. And those can be damaging to your health. You don't want to be drinking rancid fish oil. Do you think it's fair enough to do like a good old-fashioned sniff test? Like you open up your fish oil, and if it smells stanky, like, you know, throw it out kind of scenario? Yeah, that's that's a really good uh, good way to do it. Um it, un unfortunately, sometimes fish oil, you know, when you smell it, even in the bottle, it doesn't, it doesn't have a rancid smell, you know, because it's locked up in the soft gel. Um, so I would experiment with, with a few. You want to make sure though, that number one, it's, mole it's molecularly distilled. And number two, you want to make sure that it has an antioxidant blend mixed with it. So that if there is a small amount of the oil that's oxidized, um, these uh, antioxidants neutralize it or the antioxidants, more importantly, the reason why they're there is to just kind of scavenge um, the soft gel and the little teeny bit of air that's there and make sure that no oxidation occurs. Nice. Okay. I want to pivot here and talk a little bit about blood sugar because I think there's a lot of people listening that would like to have better blood sugar. Maybe they've been pre-diabetic and they're looking to improve that. So diet, fasting, exercise, key tenets to improving glycemic control. But I imagine there's also some stuff you can take in terms of different phytonutrients. What would you suggest someone look at if they want to improve their insulin sensitivity, they want to have healthier blood, blood sugars? What are some of the main things that you believe are very beneficial? Yeah, one of the, one of the best compounds is uh, phytonutrients is called fluoridzin. And fluoridzin really helps to control both uh, uh, blood sugar. It prevents um, advanced glycation end products. So what happens is when you have a lot of sugar in the body, it forms these pro-inflammatory advanced glycation end products that cause all sorts of problems. And so fluoridzin, it prevents uh, anti-glycation products and it does a really good job in insulin control. And fluoridzin is found in apples. That's where you, you get most of it. And, huh. um, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Apples just contain so many different phytonutrients. It has a nice, good mix nice. of prebiotic fiber and it's a really good thing to eat. Is there a particular kind of apple? Cause there's many different varieties. Is one better than the other? Is it a granny Smith? Is it a Fuji apple? Like what are we, what apples should we go out and buy? Yeah. Most of the studies have found that actually the, just the classic red delicious is okay. really good. Um, it contains uh, probably the largest amount of phytonutrients in the literature that's been studied, but there's all sorts of different cultivars of apples. One, one trick though, is the more tart it is, the more, the larger the amount of polyphenols because that yeah, the yeah. polyphenols kind of give that tart, right? kind of that tart, bitter taste to it. So mm -hmm. um, the more tart and, and bitterish it is uh, by nature, the larger amount of polyphenols. And um, you know, uh, so, so, something a lot of times the smaller the apple, the more tart and the more packed it is. It's really interesting how um, w one of the things I'm just fascinated about is what I call the phytonutrient drain. That throughout the process of cultivating and breeding, not just apples but different fruits, they're now bred for their um, se their sensory properties. They're bred for their sweetness, right, their right. taste. Um, and, and these different properties, you know, thick skin and all these sorts of things that make it a good experience for the end user. But a lot of times when you do that and you mix up the genetic makeup, we're not talking about GMO here, but just yeah, the yeah. just the breeding process, a lot of times, and it's not on purpose, you'll lose some of these polyphenols. So these right, apples, right. you know, that are as big as your head, when you analyze them, they don't have as much polyphenols as some of the smaller, more tart right. ones. Right, right. That makes a ton of sense. And it makes me think of the same story with blueberries, like the combination of wild blueberries, those tiny little tart guys versus like the big juicy sugary blueberries we have today, which have much less polyphenols in them. Right. Yeah. So the more um, wild you can get in general, uh, the higher amount of phytonutrients. Mm -hmm. Is it because these wild varieties are producing these phytonutrients basically for themselves, you know, like as resistance to pests and like... Why do plants produce these things? Just like, I don't know, like philosophically, like I mean, for potentially like we benefit from them and there's humans and fruits probably have some kind of, we've, we've kind of co-evolved in some sense. Um, but, but tell me, like, I'm just curious, like why are plants making these things? Yeah. A lot of times they make them for defense. You're right on. Um, they use them as natural insecticides to ward off predators, you know, because plants, 
they can't run, they can't jump, they can't <laughs> hide. They're they're vulnerable to attack, and so they produce these these phytonutrients to ward off predators. They also produce them for communication purposes. So there's mm. really interesting literature that actually phytonutrients can be passed through root systems, or a lot of times these phytonutrients are semi-volatile, so they can actually waft through the air and um and communicate with other species nearby that turn on genes or chemical switches that allow them to do a bunch of different things. So um, wow, defense wow. and communication are the major ones. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a whole new field called chemical ecology where they actually study these phytonutrients in plants and try to figure out what they do. There's really cool um, research on phytonutrients being anti -fetans. So in different types of grasses, uh, they found that when ruminants, when livestock start to feed on the grasses, the grasses next to the grasses that are being fed on will actually start producing tannins and other mm -hmm. phytonutrients that make the that make the cows sick. So as they yeah, start yeah. to eat more of the grass, they eat it, it has these phytonutrients, they get sick and they stop uh, they stop grazing on the plants. So right, right. Th there's a lot of really cool stuff like that. It's now, just a such a people, beautiful feedback mechanism, right? I mean, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. You know, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, if the plant is using this for defense, you know, it's defense compounds. So it's terrible for us because we're eating these these plant defense compounds. And like you said, humans and plants have evolved over thousands of years. And um, as we see when we were talking before that 50% of all pharma drugs come from plants, these phytonutrients, while they might ward off, you know, a caterpillar or a gypsy mm -hmm. moth, they're medicinal to us yeah, in most yeah. cases. Yeah, they are. And and I think my understanding too is like some of these things are stressors, minor stressors for our bodies. And like we get this hormetic effect when you ingest something too. It's like the body responds to something that might be a, like a small dose of poison that could be medicine. And I guess in a sense, you could say it's like the body's like, wow. And it elicits a, a favorable response. Like our bodies love to be stressed in the right amounts so we can create an adaptive response. And yeah, obviously the plants are doing phenomenal things or we wouldn't have a billion, multi-billion dollar industry based off of like taking these compounds and, and trying to purify and strengthen and package them for sale. Okay, so let's keep on going. Um, any other, you know, foods or phytonutrients that you believe are particularly important for people as they're kind of getting into the back half of life? Yeah, so for, for blood sugar control, another really cool phytonutrient is called pinoresinol. And it's from, you can find it in large amounts in kale, broccoli, cabbage, sesame seeds, garlic, soy, strawberries, and peaches. And it actually uh, increases insulin sensitivity in the body. So as we age, as we get older, insulin sensitivity can be a problem. The cells can become resistant to insulin. And that's obviously the hallmark of type 2 diabetes. So we want to keep insulin sensitivity really high. And this compound is really good at insulin sensitivity. Another, another phytonutrient, which is too long to say, um, you know, but the, but the nickname is 4MD, is also really good at regulating insulin, and it's only found in large amounts in tarragon. Now, I don't know mm. if you or your peeps have, have used tarragon for cooking, but Maybe tarragon, a few times. A few times. <laughs> yeah, tarragon is an amazing herb. And, and just in general, herbs and spices, we need to make sure that we're cooking with a lot of these. You know, it's, yeah. it's really interesting that American food we basically use no spices at all, hey, right? Hey. Whereas you look at these these international foods, Thai and Indian and and other cultures, they use tons of spices. And these spices and herbs are packed; they, they're phytonutrient powerhouses. So we need to make sure that we're that we're cooking with herbs and spices as much as we can. If we're doing that, then we're getting large amounts of phytonutrients in general. That's a wonderful reminder. So I think for everyone listening is like those perfect plates that people are making at night, which is a concept we have where fill it with half veggies, quarter protein, a quarter of some healthy carbs or fats, kind of like a portion guideline. Spice that protein up. See what you can do with your vegetables to get more uh, herbs and spices in there. Just amazing. And I think that's cool because those are like non-caloric sources of phytonutrients that make your food taste better and give you medicinal benefits. Like that's crazy cool. Yeah. Another spice that is just amazing. When you look at all the different phytonutrients that are around and their benefits, and you look at what foods contain the highest amount, another one is Mexican oregano. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. It, it is a phytonutrient powerhouse as well. It, it helps with uh, glucose control, with cholesterol control. It helps with weight loss. And there's just a bunch of other things that it helps with. So um, if you haven't tried Mexican, Mexican oregano, you can find it at the store. It's not too hard to find. Tarragon, same thing. Uh, just 
mix it up. Give it a try. Mexican oregano tastes a little bit different from oregano, but in the things that I've tried in every recipe that you use oregano, you can use Mexican oregano. Now, it won't taste the same, but it doesn't taste bad. You know, it's kind of in yeah, the same yeah. same genre, the same family, which is why they're they're called, you know, both oregano. So it's it's a cool thing to try as well. Nice. Okay. This is a it might seem a little off topic, but what are your thoughts on teas? Like using like steeping plants in water to get benefits, but also just basically having water. Do you, do, is tea a part of your life? Do you, is it something that you use or something you recommend? And I'm not just talking about caffeinated teas. I'd also be talking about herbal teas, maybe like a ginger tea or a peppermint tea or something like this. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's a really nice way, non-calorically and really readily easy to get uh, phytonutrients because a lot of these phytonutrients are water soluble, especially mm-hmm. when you use hot water, obviously, like you do with the tea. So um, I like to steep. It's a little expensive, but when I can, um, saffron makes an amazing tea. You just take a few threads of saffron. Uh, saffron contains compounds called crocin and crocetin. And saffron's really good with weight loss. It's really good at helping with um, hormone levels. So um, one of the natural remedies that's been used for thousands of years in some cultures is saffron tea for PMS symptoms mm-hmm. and even w- even during uh, perimenopause. Nice, um, nice. So that's a really nice tea to make. Peppermint tea, I love that. It contains large amounts of phytonutrients. Um, yeah, I love experimenting with teas. There's a plant from Hawaii called mamaki that, that I use and it doesn't contain caffeine. Uh, it contains large amounts of phytonutrients. Um, I, I love uh, rooibos tea. From South, from South Africa. The bioactive compound aspilanthin is amazing when it comes to overall metabolic health. It's shown to help with uh, blood sugar control, cholesterol control, and weight management. Nice. I've been drinking a lot of holy basil tea. It's a nice kind of like adaptogen and it's just generally pairs really well. There's a brand, Organic India. They make really wonderful teas paired with the base of holy basil. So yeah, I just for everyone listening, if you are interested in mixing it up, Get some hot water drinks with some plants in there can be very good. And I would say get high quality stuff like buy organic teas, ideally from reputable companies that don't put a lot of crap in the the bleaches and dyes and stuff in the bags. Um, Because the quality of the plant material that you do have there and how it's grown ultimately affects what ends up being in the tea, not just in terms of the medicinal properties, but you just don't want low quality crap and steep it in water. So just a minor aside. All right. So talk to me about curcumin. Like in, in some sense, I thought like that would come up earlier in discussion because in my mind, I was thinking this seems like such a good thing for people over 40 because it's a very potent global anti-inflammatory. It has some anti-cancer benefits uh, and it's readily available. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you consider it a staple or how does that pair with the fact that we're probably getting some omega-3s now from our different sources? How does that play in terms of a, a supplement protocol for people after 40? Yeah, I love curcumin. It's it's really good. I I haven't mentioned it as much just because it's pretty common. Um, but it it is really good at regulating inflammation in the body. And um, one of the good things, one of the amazing things about curcumin and all these phytonutrients that I've talked about is they help to regulate biosignaling mechanisms in the body. So when we talk about how these phytonutrients are working, um, there's an area of science that, that I love that I that I study called signal transduction cascade. So basically, it's a process by which the body has millions of chemical reactions that it does every single second. These reactions are controlled by enzymes, which are the mo- molecular machines that make the work hap- happen. If we step back, these enzymes are produced by genes, which are the chemical switches in the body that turn the the production of enzymes uh, on and off. And then if you step back even more, you have these uh, signaling mechanisms that turn the genes on. And from what we found, the major mechanism of action for these phytonutrients is they regulate these signaling mechanisms. So Mm -hmm. these signaling mechanisms can be thought of as a string of dominoes, right? You push Mm -hmm. one down, they all go down and they turn on the genes and away you go. Uh, Lifestyle factors can actually slide these dominoes out of place just a little bit or they can pull them all the way out. And as you know, when you mess around with dominoes, if you slide one or two of these out, even just a little bit, the whole cascade effect doesn't happen, right? You know, yeah, you, yeah. you push them over and five or six go, it hits that out of uh, that out of place one. Maybe it knocks down a couple others, but then it stops. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and it's really nice that we can we have tools from nature that can help make this all work better with upstream upstream proper signaling. That's really beautiful. 
Yeah, so curcumin's great when it comes to um, supplementation. It's good. Bioavailability with with turmeric is an issue with curcuminoids, and so you want to make sure that you're taking it uh, with something like uh, piperine from black pepper or chrysin from honey or um, th- there's a few others. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, there's a few others uh, phytonutrients that help with nutrient absorption. So mm-hmm. so that's that's the thing. So I'm more of a fan of getting curcumin from from foods, you know, eating curries and different things that contain large amounts of turmeric. Um, and, and that helps that way. I'm curious, like, so, you know, Bioperin is a trademark product of that black pepper extract that's in a lot of different supplements. And we use it in some of our supplements that we have curcumin just to increase the bioavailability. If I were to go out and eat a curry and I were to like crack some black pepper on it, is there enough piperine in the black pepper to like give me absorbed benefits of that? There is. Yeah. So I, I, I tell my people, you want to be putting pepper on everything. I mean, I, I put pepper on everything, you know, it, as much as you can stand, obviously you don't want to put so much that it's just nasty, you know, and, and being a martyr for the cause, you don't want to do that. But, you know, I think a lot of times we, we sit down to eat our food and it tastes okay. And so we just, we just eat it and that's great. But if, if you can stand it, I always have the, the pepper right next to me. And I put a little bit on just by nature. I'm, I'm you know, glad we got the secrets. Like, we got the secrets towards the end of this conversation, everyone. Dr. Dan Peppercracker is the key to absorbing all this stuff. This is good. That's right. My wife jokes, you know, if once or twice I don't forget, she's like, you forgot your pepper. And I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> oh, snap. Yeah. Pepper's good. Okay. You should okay. use it as often as you can. Very nice. Well, I think this has so far been a wealth of information. And I'd love to kind of put this on a bow and turn it over to you on anything else you feel like would be relevant to share, whether that's words of wisdom and, or encouragement just generally about health and what it takes to be healthy, if it's more down the line of, of what we've been discussing. But I, I'd love for you to share a little bit more before we wrap this up. We're, we're coming close to time of these episodes. Awesome. Um, yeah, what, what I would share is there's all sorts of supplements you can take and supplements are amazing. And, you know, I... I formulate supplements. That's what I do for my day job. And um, supplements help to bridge the gap between where we are and where we need to be. So we need science-based supplements. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would say, though, is um, it's hard to find supplements. You know, it's, it's great that, that that your listeners have someone like you that's an expert that can break down supplements and recommend what to take and what not to take. But for a lot of people, it's really hard. You know, mm-hmm. supplements is kind of this red ocean thing. Um, so I would, I would break it down to just eating good food. When you go shopping, don't shop in the middle of the grocery store. That's where all the, uh, food like substances, the FLSs are. Mm -hmm. You want to really focus on getting phytonutrients. And if you focus on getting phytonutrients, you'll be amazed at what, what it does to your health, you know, to just make sure you're getting a lot of vegetables and fruits. Mother nature has given us uh, clues, right? Where different colors are of these foods represent different types of phytonutrients because right, organic right. compounds, they absorb um, light at different wavelengths yeah, depending yeah. on the different chemical structures. And so if you make sure that you're getting a bunch of natural foods, shopping around the outside of the of the store and doing the best you can, you know, it can be expensive with different things, but I would say experiment. You know, we mm-hmm. talked about tarragon um, and, and these different uh, herbs. Um, rutabaga is another one. You know, um, Jerusalem artichokes has right, some really right. cool phytonutrients. So just experiment and 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 try to maybe incorporate a new food. One, uh, you know, once every other week, and just kind of see how you like it. And if you do that, focusing on phytonutrients, you'll see a huge benefit in how you how you feel, how your metabolism is working, how your skin is looking. It'll be more radiant. Um, mood will improve. And it's just, it's just amazing when, um, people coming back to me saying, Hey, yeah, I'm eating more phytonutrients and I just feel better. And they look better when they come to you. You could just tell. And and I'm sure all the people listening to your podcast, they've experienced that, but I encourage them to keep going, experiment around with phytonutrients and continue on that journey. Man, such perfect words of encouragement at the end here. Like I'm, I'm excited. Like this week, my wife and I go buy something new. We're going to pick up something new off the grocery shelf. 
uh, and and maybe even look it up. It'd be fun to type in like phytonutrients found in you know whatever we end up buying, and and just to get the education component. This whole nutrition journey can be an adventure, an adventure of of learning and healing. And it's also very clear it's working fantastically for you, Doctor Dan. I mean, you're full of life and energy. Your skin looks fantastic, and it's been a pleasure having you on to get to talk to everyone. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I think there's going to be a lot more people eating apples, having celery, you know, doing trying different spices from this conversation, and it's a beautiful service that you just gave to everyone. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate you so much. Oh, same here. Such a delight to be on. Thank you.